Athletes will do anything they can to win, even if it means breaking the rules or finding loopholes to go around them. Here's the list of some of the most famous athletes in history and the rules their sports were forced to change, either because of their dominance, safety, or genius thinking outside the box. Shaquille O'Neal, Zone D, Stronger Backboards, hack -a shack at the turn of the millennium, Shaquille O'Neal was undoubtedly the best player in the NBA. Unbelievably quick and athletic for his 7'1", 330-pound frame, Shaq had to be doubled almost every time he got the ball in the post. Otherwise, it was either a basket or a foul. Prime Shaq was, in my mind, the most dominant force we have ever seen in basketball, and the NBA thought so too. To prevent the league from becoming full of jacked-up behemoths just to fend off Shaq, and to give everybody a fighting chance, they implemented new rules after 2001 and the Lakers' second championship. Zone defense became legal again because nobody could guard Shaq one-on-one, -on -one, and defensive three seconds were instituted to make it easier to drive to the basket. Players also couldn't foul a player without the ball in the last two minutes of the game, which was known mainly as the hack shack rule. O'Neal was also responsible for NBA backboards getting stronger after he shattered two backboards in his rookie season. Pat Venditti, Pitching Handedness being ambidextrous is helpful in all aspects of life, whether it's doing work around the house, writing, or playing sports. In baseball, it's especially helpful, and switch hitters have been present in the sport forever. But when Pat Venditti showed up, he became the first professional switch pitcher and is widely recognized as the only player who can effectively pitch with both hands. Pitchers generally have an advantage when pitching to a batter who bats with the same hand, so Venditti was always able to put himself in the optimal position. However, the problem came when he would face a switch hitter and both players would continuously switch sides, playing a game of cat and mouse until the umpire stepped in. To stop the confusion, the MLB instituted a rule that pitchers must declare which hand they want to pitch with before each at bat. It's a rule designed for one player, and that's why it's called the Pat Venditti rule. Ray Boom Boom Mancini, Standing 8 Count Ray Mancini was a WBA lightweight champion between 1982 and 1984. In his second title defense, he faced the Korean fighter Kim Duk-koo, who had a true warrior mentality and who famously said before the match, either he dies or I die. And the way the fight started, those were proven not to be empty words. Both fighters were giving it their all, trading punches at an incredible rate. However, towards the end of the fight, the more experienced Mancini started to dominate as Kim had never fought in a 15-round fight before. In round 13, Boom Boom lived up to his nickname as he delivered 44 consecutive punches to the struggling Korean who was barely standing on his feet. In the 14th, Mancini knocked Kim down, and the ref finally declared the fight over. Unfortunately, due to such heavy punishment during the fight, Kim fell into a coma shortly after the fight, and he died in the hospital four days later. As a result of this tragic accident, the Nevada State Athletic Commission imposed a standing eight count, which allows a referee to call a knockdown even if the boxer is not down but heavily struggling and on on the verge of being knocked down. After the fight, the WBC reduced the number of rounds from 15 to 12. WBA and the IBF followed in 1987, and the WBO did the same a year later. Tom Dempsey, Kicking Shoes Tom Dempsey set an NFL record for the longest field goal in 1970 with a 63-yard successful kick. It stood for 43 years until Matt Prater made a 64-yard field goal in 2013, which stood until 2021, and Justin Tucker's 66-yard game-winning field goal off the crossbar. But the best part about Dempsey's record is not its longevity, but the fact that he made the field goal with a deformed foot because he basically had half a foot. Dempsey had to wear a specialty shoe, which some opponents thought was illegal since its surface was flat on the front, looking almost like a hammer. After much debate, the NFL finally instituted the Tom Dempsey rule in 1977, which stated that any shoe that is worn by a player with an artificial limb on his kicking leg must have a kicking surface that conforms to that of a normal kicking shoe. Tiger Woods Longer courses, tighter fairways Tiger Woods is arguably the best golfer in history, and his legacy to the sport goes beyond the number of tournaments he's won or records he's broken. If you look at today's golfers, they look like athletes, simply because they are. Before Tiger came along, nobody was running or spending time in the gym, and more golfers had a diet closer to John Daly than Tiger.
Tiger. When Tiger showed up, due to his talent and training regimen, he was soon averaging drives that flew 25 yards further than any other player off the tee. Soon enough, the courses started to get tiger-proofed. Holes were longer, trees were added to obstruct the longer drives, tees were moved backward, and fairways narrowed. It was all done to stop Tiger from dominating and shattering course records. However, adding length to a course, letting the grass grow a bit more, and narrowing fairways did not slow Tiger down, because it made it harder for everybody else, too. It was only after everybody else started training and preparing like him that they could hit the ball as far as him. And nowadays, almost all of the best players in the world can hit 300-yard drives. Will Chamberlain, inbounding over the backboard, free throw dunking, offensive goaltending. Only one center can compare with Shaq in terms of physical strength, and that's Wilt Chamberlain. And just like O'Neal, the NBA was forced to implement rules to stop him from dominating and make the games more interesting. They changed the free throw rule, prohibiting players from crossing the line after a free throw because Wilt would always lob the ball to himself off the backboard and then dunk it for two points. As an homage to Wilt, or just because he thought it was funny, Shaq did the same thing during an All-Star game. And the basket didn't count, of course. The NBA also prohibited inbounding the ball over the backboard because Wilt abused opposing teams, positioning himself under the basket and just putting down lob dunks every time the ball went out of bounds. They also widened the paint from 12 to 16 feet to stop him from receiving the ball near the basket and introduced offensive goaltending. Before Shaq and Wilt, George Mikan was the original big man and the most dominant NBA center. Mikan was responsible for lane widening from 6 to 12 feet and the invention of the defensive goaltending rule because Mikan would just stand under the basket and swat away every shot attempt before it touched the rim. The NBA even experimented with a 12-foot basket during one game to make life more challenging for the uber-dominant Mikan. However, the idea was soon scrapped because the new basket height made it extremely hard for everybody else to score. Lester Hayes, stick em. Stick'em is an adhesive created by Muller Sports Medicine, a U.S. company that wanted to improve grip in sports such as powerlifting, gymnastics, and pole vault. However, it didn't take long for its benefits to be discovered by the NFL, namely the Oakland Raiders, whose equipment manager introduced Stick'em to his players in the late 70s. For obvious reasons, Stick'em was a big hit among players, who suddenly couldn't drop a pass anymore. The Raiders won the Super Bowl in 1980, and their cornerback, Lester Hayes, won the Defensive Player of the Year award in 1980, after he led the NFL with 19 interceptions in the season and playoffs combined. You practically had to pry the ball loose from him whenever he got his hands on it said one of his teammates. Even though the rest of the team used Stick'em in small amounts on their hands, Hayes would apply Stick'em all over his arms and jersey, drawing more attention to the substance. After it was finally banned in 1981, the Stick'em ban was named the Lester Hayes Rule. After the ban, Hayes' interception numbers dropped by more than 50%. Bob Gibson, Lower Pitching Mounds 1968 in baseball is known as the year of the pitcher, after Bob Gibson broke almost every pitching record that existed as he won the Cy Young and MVP award. Gibson was literally unhittable that year, with 13 shutouts, 268 strikeouts, and an ERA of 1.12, by far the lowest in the live ball era. After years of pitcher dominance, this was the last straw. The MLB decided to tighten the strike zone and lower the mound by 5 inches to reduce the ball's velocity and give hitters a fighting chance. The rule changes the MLB made in 1969 were also known as the Gibson Rules. Bobby Hull and Stan Makita, Banana Blades they say that there are no two same sticks in the NHL, as every player adjusts his stick to his preference, based on length, flexibility, grip, blade curve, etc. However, there is a limit for all stick adjustments, limits that had to be created because of two men, Stan Makita and Bobby Hull. When the sport of hockey first began, the stick blade wasn't curved at all, but after Stan Makita accidentally bent his stick in the doorway of the rink, he discovered that his shots were more wild and unpredictable, making them harder to save. He and his teammate Bobby Hull then began intentionally curving the blades on their sticks, making what would be called banana blades. They were so highly curved that it created an unnatural and unpredictable movement of the puck, which was extremely dangerous, especially because helmets weren't widely used across the league. The NHL was forced to step in and place restrictions on the curvature of the stick blade. Roy Williams, Horse Collar Tackling the NFL has made a lot of rules that have made defenders' jobs a lot tougher over the years, but it's more than fair that they prohibited horse collar tackling. It's pretty much grabbing an offensive player from behind by his neck or shoulder pads and then pulling down with all your weight, just like you would pull a collar to stop a horse. After Roy Williams broke Terrell Owens' ankle with horse collar tackling, who was just one of Roy's victims over the years, the league finally prohibited that defensive maneuver. Martin Brodor, Trapezoidal Area 
Martin Brodeur is an NHL Hall of Famer, widely considered one of the best goaltenders ever, and he holds numerous NHL records for wins, games played, and shootouts. He's one of 12 goaltenders to ever score a goal in the NHL, and with three career goals to his name, he's the top goal scorer ever for a netminder. But his offensive output didn't stop there. An extremely talented stick handler, Brodor would often play as an extra defensive player, which prevented the other team from dumping the puck in the corners. Because Brodor would leave the crease and play the puck out of his end into the opposing team's defensive zone, the NHL felt that the game started to look like a tennis match, so they employed a goaltender trap zone, more commonly called the trapezoid in reference to its shape. Under the new rule that is commonly known as the Martin Brodor rule, it is prohibited for the goaltender to handle the puck anywhere behind the goal line that is not within the trapezoidal area. Eddie Stanky, Distracting Batters Here's another rule in baseball that was instituted because of one player. His name was Eddie Stanky. He played in the 40s and 50s, and apart from his usual job as an infielder, he worked as a batter distractor. Because he played second base, Stanky made a habit of jumping and waving his hands right in the sight lines of the batter to distract them during every single pitch. He pissed off opponents so much that it eventually led to a dugout clearing brawl in which the NYPD had to be called to break it up. So, the MLB subsequently made a rule to stop what was formerly known as the Stanky maneuver. Wayne Gretzky, double penalties. Wayne Gretzky was the most talented offensive player in hockey history, but his brilliance was even more pronounced with fewer players on the ice. With multiple players in the penalty box, there was more open space for Gretzky to use his speed and stick handle to score goals at will. When the refs issued double penalties and multiple players were out, it was like clockwork for the Oilers to score on every possession during the four-on-four -four or three-on-three -three action. That's why the NHL declared that when penalties were called on both teams, the matchup would remain five-on-five. -five. Those were just the lengths the league had to go to to slow down the great one. Charles Barkley, the five second rule. Charles Barkley had a great butt. I mean, for basketball. His large posterior allowed Sir Charles to create separation on post-ups and to effectively box out players much taller than him. And it's a part of the reason why he's one of the best rebounders ever. On offense, Barkley would sometimes dribble the ball with his back to the basket for an entire possession before hoisting up a shot. The NBA grew tired of him twerking for 20 seconds in the paint, so they banned it by introducing the five-second rule, stating that no player below the free-throw line could post up for longer than five seconds seconds. 